John. Yeah, right. now turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 14. Um, I, you all know me enough, uh, or at least this well, to know that several years ago I, I got to the point where I was, uh, it's December, uh, and I, and I, and I it, it just became this, uh, such a dooms thing, a, a doomsday type thing where it's Christmas, uh, it's Christmas season, everybody's active, everybody's doing everything, you got to do stuff, you got to have this, you got to do this, you got to, you know, and, and it just became so annoying to me. And um, I was I was complaining to the Lord. The Lord doesn't necessarily um, answer us or respond to complaining, but he sure will correct when we complain. You know, some people think that when we pray and we complain enough, God will go, all right, I'll do something fine. You leave me alone. Uh, no, he, he responds to faith. But when you go to him and complain, he is a good, good daddy. And so he will cor correct what you're doing. So I remember discussing it with him and going, oh, Lord, another December. Uh, what, what am I going to do? And, and, I, and, and I heard him. So he said, if you learn to embrace the season, you'll, you'll view it differently. So I said, okay. And so instead of, instead of running away from uh, Christmas songs, I downloaded as many as I could find. I, I bought as many as I could find. I, I was like, you know, we're going to, we're going to saturate everything about this church in Christmas. And, and we're going to, I'm going to do, I'm going to go crazy with Christmas. And I'm like, Jessica, we got to put up our tree tonight. I mean, we're just, we're thinking Christmas, Christmas, Christmas. And the second I did that, the Holy Spirit began showing me, uh, series to preach. I forget the first year. I know it was peace on earth, glory. Uh, it was, it was, it was that. And, uh, but it changed my view of it when I learned to embrace it. Well, I was, I, so I always go into December anticipating some kind of series. Now, what I kind of get the feeling of is that we're pausing for the month of December on Wednesday, and we're going to do some teaching and some stuff uh, in regards to the Christmas story, what I want to do, but I don't, I don't know if this is going to, what I want to do is I want to deal in a teaching atmosphere of the myths of Christmas or where we get things wrong in Christmas. Uh, cause I, there are some things, um, but, but we'll, 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 we have three Wednesdays before Christmas. So we'll see how that goes. But if the Holy Spirit gives me a sermon for Christmas on, I, mean, I think Christmas Day, I'll probably have one at least. Um, but, uh, but if he gives me one, I'll, I'll share one. But right now the Holy Spirit said, you didn't get done with what I gave you last week. And so I said, all right. And so, uh, so we're, we're going to get right back in there where John chapter 14, verse 12, where it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, he shall do. Also, and greater works than these shall you do because I go to my father. Now, I'm not going to teach. I'm not going to bring it out like I did last week, because last week we spent a lot of time at the beginning talking about how Jesus cast out demons. He he saw multitudes healed. He didn't go to a funeral uh, that was a successful funeral. He, uh, uh, he, he, he's, I mean, he, he would, he was a giver. I mean, he was a, he was a giver extraordinaire where when I, even when they sent Judas out after Jesus said, hey, whatever you do, go do quickly. The, the, the other disciples thought Jesus is just having him go either get more food for us or, uh, or give to some somebody else because that's who he was. And so there's so many things that Jesus did that we sit there and we read the scripture and we go, oh, I want, I want to have a, a healing ministry like Jesus had. And again, uh, the focus, one of the focuses we had last week was, was the fact that Jesus, um, uh, if, if all, if, if books were written on everything he did in his three and a half years of ministry, the world could not hold the volumes of it. It would literally be. Um, uh, it, it'd be impossible to write it all. 
So that means that uh, the, the stuff that we do know of him, literally when he says things like uh, multitudes were healed, he's literally saying we couldn't count them all. If they could have counted, if they could have kept track of it, if they could have said, and they, and they kept track of tens and twenties and hundreds and thousands. He kept, kept track of thousands. And so when he says multitudes were healed, that means it was a lot of people. So let's write a story on each and every one of those. You, you found me on that. And, and, and so, so when he says the works that I do, you'll do, because they had sat there and watched it happen. Okay, Jesus gets baptized. He goes into the wilderness, and then he starts his ministry. Then he calls, starts calling his disciples and starts his ministry. So there were many of them that were there through everything he did, if not all of them. So if they were there, then, then they recognized that night when he says, the works I do, you'll do, and greater works than these you'll do. That night that he spoke that to them towards the end of his ministry, they began going backwards and going, what? Because they were there for the volumes of healings. They were there for the volumes of lives set free. They were there for the volumes of demons cast out. They were there for the miraculous, for the creative miracles. They were there. So when he said, the works that I do, th their minds went, <clears throat> because it was like, that is extraordinary. And I think that's how we feel to a level from what we know when we understand that 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 what could be added on to that then our minds start going I haven't even started I haven't even I haven't even I, I've only just begun <laughs> right I mean that's we we we're, it, it's extraordinary but so often when we read John 14, 12, we go to all those big miracles. But see, Jesus' life was more than just, just performing miracles because the greatest miracle that he had was when people believed in him. When he changed a life, when a life was that was in turmoil is now renewed and restored and refreshed and, 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 and lives that are where, where people have been stealing. Uh, it, taxes and, 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 and stealing from people are now so changed like Zacchaeus that he's like, I'm going to give back to people more than I took from them. When the, when, when, he, when the Spirit of God that was on him is transformed to somebody else and their lives are changed, that was the number one focus on his life. Uh Hallelujah. And so why can it not, why is it not our number one focus? But I'm going to pray for people and see them healed. It's cool. That's good. I will not I will not shortchange that at all. I'm going to share the good news. I'm going to I'm going to share about prosperity. That's awesome. I'm going to share about the joy of the Lord and the peace of God that he can bring in lives. That's cool. But unless their lives are changed and they begin and they come into the saving knowledge of Jesus in a relationship with him, everything that you're sharing with them is only, can be a one-time visit. I'm not saying that healing is not, there, there's not access. We're going to get into that. That, that it, it, it's not a great way to open the door. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is that we want lives changed. Jesus didn't say go into all the world and, and just, you know, heal them. Was healing part of it? Absolutely. You'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. But right up top, it was I want you to make disciples. I want people's lives changed. I don't want to heal them just to heal them. Yes, healing is, is, is extraordinary. It's the Father's heart. I don't want you to, to heal them just to heal them. I want their lives changed. I want a relationship with them. 
I want the flesh out of the way and I want the spirit to take over. And that can only be done by accepting Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And so we dealt with that last week, and I, I, there's so much that I could go and, and, and refresh, but I, I wanted to just make sure that we remembered the, le- the area that we are on. But I want to get into an area today, um, and, and I've got to guard myself on this, but I've got to guard myself on this, uh, but I don't know that I, I recognize during worship that what the, what the Holy Spirit was doing is what I was teaching. And so he was like, he was like, he told, he told me at about when Steve took over, he said, don't rush this thing. And, and, <laughs> and I didn't. And I, and, and, and so, but it was an object lesson of what we're talking about here today. Because what we're dealing with here is the Holy Spirit's position, the part of the Holy Spirit in sharing Jesus with others. Because a lot of times we get into that mentality. Matter of fact, it is astonishing to me that a lot of Pentecostal, even denominations, who's, who cut their teeth on baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, are nowadays even saying, hey, maybe we've put too much emphasis on that. And we wonder why the church is, are in the position they're in. Rick Renner has a book that I've been working my way through, not quickly, but it's, it, it's called Ablazed. Uh, I, I forget the full name, but it's, it's Ablazed, Ablazed for God. And so I, I've been actually feeding on that a lot uh, uh, the last couple of weeks because it's just been one of those things that the Holy Spirit was showing me is that the church, the church isn't what the church is today. Yes, there are mega churches, and yes, there are a lot of things, but there's a lot of weirdness in churches today. The church isn't the church that it is today because of uh, because of too much Jesus and too much of the Holy Spirit. The church is what it is today is because we've 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 replaced the Holy Spirit with a lot of stuff. There's a there's a quote. Um, I just have to remember not to say it later. Uh, a. W. Tozer said, "If the Holy Spirit was with, was with, <laughs> if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, ninety five percent of what we do would go on, and no one would know the difference. If the Holy Spirit had had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, the old, uh, the 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 early the Acts church, ninety five percent of what they did would stop, and everybody would know the difference." And I like that statement. There's a statement that, that, that got me thinking is that if we, are, if we become more aware of the Holy Spirit and that gift, the heavenly language, I mean, I'm standing up here this morning and I just become very aware. I'm, yes, I've been teaching, I've been very aware of it. And, and we get into that quiet point part where she's just playing on that. And, and it's, like, it's like, let's just all lift up our voices in our heavenly language. And I don't know how many of you heard it. I don't know how many of you joined in with me, but it was right after that. Word of prophecy, word of prophecy, direction. It's because when we give that Holy Spirit, give the Holy Spirit and that heavenly language access to operate in our lives, we move into new levels of power and understanding. See, we've gotten to the point where we we live in a generation of participation trophies. The only time I think participation trophies are okay is when they don't keep score. You know, after that, I I remember um, somebody came up to me one year when I was coaching, a second or third year when when they were when we were keeping score, and they said I want to buy trophies for the team, and I said on one uh, on one condition. I said, what is that? We win something. I said, if we win the regular season or finish in second place, I'll let you have one for second place. Or if we win the, win the tournament or finish in second place, I'll let you buy trophies. And they're like, what? I said, listen, we can, I, want, I, I want us to know the, 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 I want us to know the importance of, of not just participating. I mean, have, have, a, have a pizza party for, for the participation. But, but the awards come when you have done what you need to do. 
some people are going, well, I think that's crazy, Pastor. That I'm, well, that's just how I view things. Hey, Amen. I, I had a I had a kid. <laughs> this is not helping my sermon. I had a kid when I was a youth pastor, who um, who we we did a our, our uh, youth a youth retreat at our at our home church. It was before they did all the renovations there, and so we had. I mean, we did. We had three three days. We got there, had two nights there. And it was stunk like a pigsty when we were done, but it but it was extraordinary. We had a great service, and I re, I ran it like a camp. So we had a had a three day competition where we were going against each other and, and doing these things. It was a lot of fun. But one kid at the end of the thing, the winning team got these little trophies. And they weren't they weren't huge, but they were little trophies, and and I awarded them to the teams the the team that won. And this one kid came up to me. And the look in his eyes was priceless. And he said, Pastor Thad, I have never won a trophy. He'd gotten some, but he had never won a trophy. He said, this is the coolest thing ever. I said, it is, isn't it? So anyway, that's, that's just, but that's, but that's my point is that we're so used to that. Well, we're participating. So therefore, I'm a Christian. So obviously, the Holy Spirit can, will work in me like it works in anybody else. And that's just inaccurate according to Scripture. When you get born again, the Holy Spirit takes up residence. Therefore, you can be directed. You can have that still small voice. You can do that kind of stuff. But if you want the Holy Ghost to take over, you need that next, what, what a lot of terminology is, the subsequent work of the Holy Spirit, which is to be baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. The disciples, when they went into the upper room, they were born again. There's no question about it. They didn't get born again in the upper room and then get the Holy Spirit. They were born again when they went into the upper room. And when they got to the upper room, there was a subsequent, uh, which means a following experience where the Holy Spirit came on them and they began to speak in new tongues. And that is the pattern that goes through there. Often in the word, often in Scripture, it talks about being filled with the Spirit, and people are like, um, I, "You're filled with the Spirit because you're born again." No, that's what being baptized is. Because how does God fill things up? Yeah, to overflowing. You don't want Him filling up your bathtub because He doesn't know when to stop. So, so the uh, Cornelius's house, they spoke in other tongues. It, it is the pattern they spoke in other tongues. Now, sometimes people go, but here they said they're filled with the Holy Spirit, and then and they didn't mention speaking in tongues. Again, if it's already been established, you know what came. All right, I, I'm not going to argue. I'm not arguing this. I just really want us to understand that, beloved. So many Christians are born again. They're going to heaven. They are living for Jesus. They're doing a lot of things, but they're really frustrated. What Pastor Mike said today. I, I really am just like the, the Holy Spirit is just you know going off inside of me because of the way I don't do anything on purpose. The only thing I have slightly on purpose is my last song today. Uh, if we do if we do an altar time is Holy Spirit. That's the only thing I did on purpose today. Everything else and the Holy Spirit has orchestrated everything else. And, and so when Pastor Mike uh, is talking about. Um, I'm talking about all the rugged stuff you go through and all that kind of stuff. Uh, let me share another quote with you, which I, I, I know this is supposed to be later, but it's not. Uh, but D.L. Moody said it like this. How easy is it to work for God? Some of y'all are already lost. Going, Bloop. What do you mean working for God? It wears me out. I, I don't even know what to do. It just It's hard work working for God. He said, how easy is it to work to God when you're filled with the Holy Ghost? His service is so sweet and so delightful. He is not a hard master. People talk about being overworked and breaking down. It is not so. It is over worry and care that wears people out. Why do so many workers break down? Not for overwork, but because there's been friction of the machinery. And there's not been enough oil of the Holy Spirit. Great engines have their machinery so arranged that where there is great friction, there is oil droppings on it at all times. 
So it's a good thing for Christians to have plenty of oil. And how do you oil it up? Through the, through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You begin speaking to him in that heavenly language. Hallelujah. I mean, look, look, go, go to um, John 1. Remember, Jesus says, the works that I do, you'll do and greater. Because I go to my Father. Which is exactly the setup of where he says, if I don't go to my Father, the Holy Spirit can't come. Which he said in John also. Acts tells us that this gift of the Holy Spirit is for everybody. And, and, I, and I like the wording of it where it says, it is for you and for your children and for all that are far off. Which means people go, that was a New Testament thing. That was a one-time thing. No. <laughs> how, how many of us would consider ourselves a far off from the, uh, as a, in time-wise from the early church? So it's for us too. And it's for the next generation, the next generation. It's just that early generation understood the importance of it. Paul... Is Paul shows up at the church at the Council of Jerusalem, and they're kind of annoyed because um, because of his saying. He's saying, "Listen, um, Cornelius's house, the Holy Spirit fell on them, and it was and it was and God moved on them." I went there, and, and 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 they all got a little annoyed. And then he starts going through the process of what happened, and he says, "Listen, the very same thing that happened to us on the day of Pentecost happened to them there." The exact same thing. So how are we to say it's not available to them? And when they when they heard that, they said, okay, that it's real. Amen. All right. But notice here in John chapter 1, Jesus lived about 30 years. And many people believe, well, he lived about 33 years, but he lived about 30 years before he was baptized. In the water, he he. So he had a lifetime of really being probably in his dad's business, working with Joseph as a carpenter, and 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 that'll that'll be more of a, uh, a lesson. Maybe we cover uh, go a little bit more through that. But but he worked about you know whatever it had been from the time he turned into a man until to about thirty years old. He he worked with his daddy. Um, people say. Uh, you know, matter of fact, there's a lot of, a uh, lot of, there's a, isn't there a movie about what Jesus did as a baby, as a kid where he, where he'd see a dead bird and pick it up and it'd flatter away and he'd be like, ah, oh, because Jesus was Jesus, right? There is no record anywhere ever of Jesus doing anything with power in his life. There's no record of it. Matter of fact, what does it say in Acts? In Acts 10, it says that he did everything that he did. He was anointed with the Holy Ghost and with power because God was with him. In other words, it was he was subject to, to what God, his father, was going to do in him. He's going to explain. He couldn't do things his own way. He couldn't just get up and go, you know what? If, I, if, if I've got this purpose and this plan on me, I'm going to start healing birds. I'm going to, I'm going to practice by walking the mud puddles. <laughs> he couldn't just start there. He, he was submitted. He said, everything I see my father do, I do. Everything I hear my father say, that's what I say. I don't step out of his plan. And so because... the. Again, because there's no record of him in his first 30 years doing anything that we know of of power, there it is, there is a major probability that there wasn't a whole lot. Uh, remember what he said to his mama in John chapter 3, his first miracle? He said, woman, it's not my time yet. It's time to do what? To step in to what God the Father, you, you follow me on this. So there's no record in Scripture or outside of Scripture of Jesus having done anything. It's, it, it, at best, it would be speculation, and I think it would be poor speculation to say that he went around doing little things. Did he go around 
hearing the word. Yes. Did it go around? <sighs> Pastor Lisa, I just can't, I don't know what to do here. I'm born again, and I want to start a traveling ministry. Jesus himself sat under the word. He, I, yes, he was the word. I'm not. A, he sat under the teachings in the synagogue. Where was he? At about 12 years old when he when his parents went there and they left and they realized, which wasn't that weird because they they traveled with a lot of people and they left and they, he wasn't with them and they went. They're like, where's he at? And they went back there and he was he was sitting in the synagogue listening and teaching. He was so so. If Jesus needed to have what? 20, uh, not 18 years of the word in him before he stepped out into ministry. I remember Mylon Lefevre. He's he's kind of connected with the Copelands, I think, now a lot. Uh, but he used to be this man. He used to be this rock star. Mylon Lefevre and Broken Heart, and they were they were extraordinary. They they would see they would see um, auditoriums packed. And then see the altars, just people flooding in for, for, to, uh, to get born again. It was They were astonishing. Um, but when he got born again, they were a rock band before. But when they got born again, the first thing he did is he went to tell his pastor, talk to his pastor about it. And his pastor said, you need to stop. You need to get w- w- rooted in the word, rooted in prayer, rooted in the Holy Spirit before you ever step out. Amen. He came to our church in Illinois he came there a couple times, but he only performed in the church once, right? Um, but, but the one time he performed in the church, he, he had the concert that night, and then we were feeding a band in, in, in the basement. And, um, and he, uh, he, would, he would never be around. He would just be locked away in a prayer room, praying and seeking God's face for that concert. And he'd come out to eat, come out, he'd eat, and he'd go right back in there. It's kind of like, I just want to see my own Lefebvre. I was, I was a PK, man. I got to hang out in those places. But no, he just showed up to eat and went back in there to prepare. But the preparation that he had without stepping in front of anybody was what gave him the success in the spirit realm later. Well, that's the way it was for Jesus. <sighs> Praise God. Pastor Thad, why are we, why are we, why you teach so much? Why are we getting the word so much? Because we got miracles to perform. We've got things to step into. And beloved, we've done it for 18 years. It's time to step into it. All right, let's, let's. So, so Jesus is now, he's been living for about 30 years. And he comes down, and verse 32, he comes down to John the Baptist. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it stayed on him. In other words, it, 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 we, we, we picture the Holy Spirit being a dove. It didn't say it was a dove. It said as it came down, it kind of like a dove would float. It, it, it was, it's called fi, uh, figurative speech. Is that what it was? Language. It's, 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 it's a, it, this would be a simile using like or as, I'm hungry as, I, I, I'm, I'm hungry as a horse. No, you ain't. I'm so, yeah, yeah. Um, though, though, that's a figure of speech. And so when he said he dropped, the Holy Spirit dropped on him. It floated down. Many people, I believe, uh, can, can, said that when the Holy Spirit came down, it was the person of the Holy Spirit that dropped on him, that just floated down like a dove would float down on him. And, and, and a boat on him, stayed on him, didn't move off of him. And, and I knew him not, verse 33, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him. He did not. That's the thing that Jesus had that nobody else had at that time. Uh, every other person, when the Spirit would come and move, they would move upon them to do something, and then they would go. Jesus he came upon him and stayed on him. So day in and day out, Jesus walked in the power of that Holy Spirit. 
um, and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizes in the Holy Ghost. So Jesus immediately then goes in his, his, into the wilderness. And uh, I think Matthew tells us that, that he goes in the wilderness and is tempted. Uh, fast, and then is tempted. But he, as soon as he comes out of that, he begins calling his disciples in. And then chapter 3 of John shows up. Jesus hasn't done, listen, is it within the realm of possibility that for 30 years Jesus did something? I'm not, I'm just telling you what's recorded and what we have record of. So for 30 years, there's no record of anything. And then all of a sudden, he gets the spirit on him and he starts operating with power. How much spirit did he get on him? Go to John chapter 3, verse 34, I think it is. For he whom God hath sent speaks the word of God. For, the God, for, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure to him. When, when Old Testament people were getting ready to do something, the Holy Spirit would come on them and move on them for that moment. When, when, when Jesus did something, he had the Holy Spirit draped over him. Listen, I've heard people say, well, Jesus had the Holy Spirit without measure. We do too. It's just we've been limiting him. We've been limiting what he can do in us. Now listen here. This does not mean the Holy Spirit will cause us to be really weird. No, 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 let me see. He, we, we will be really weird. He's not going to cause us to do things in, in, in church environments that would go contrary to the, the order that is set in the Word of God. You say, Pastor Thad, um, I, I know Pastor Jessica spoke a word of prophecy. Pastor Elisa spoke a word of prophecy. Let's say Pastor Thad would have spoken something, which I kind of did, but it wasn't really that clear. It's hard to tell when I do and when I don't, because I'll, I'll speak things out during that. Um, and I just, I know it says two or three in a service, but I just, I just felt like I, it was just burning in me so much. No, we, you don't get, we don't get the right to do what we want to do. Because the Holy Spirit doesn't, doesn't move like that. I don't know, Pastor Thad. I think if God really wanted to... No. <laughs> All right. Oh, I am not doing well at getting through this really quick. But we are getting through it. But it said that Jesus had the Holy Spirit on him without measure. Beloved, I'm telling you what. We have been given full access to that Holy Spirit that was on him without measure. We have been given that full access, but we've been limiting him because we've been shortchanging what the Holy Spirit is all about. We've been shortchanging the gift. How, how, how many times a day do you speak in your heavenly language? That was not given to you just to use once every couple of weeks in church or, or maybe once in a while. That was given to you for daily access into the mind of Christ. And yet a lot of times we just leave it be because it's, it's I don't know, I think sometimes we can feel like it's just extra. It's something that we don't necessarily, do we need it? And beloved, it is clear here that until Jesus had the Holy Spirit come upon him without measure, that he really wasn't doing everything. I don't want to say anything because he was. He was filling himself with the word. But 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 his what he was doing in power was not there. Um but notice this. Well, where am I at here? John 3.34, it says, For he whom God hath sent speaks the word of God. Why does he speak the right words? Because the Spirit was on him without measure. All right, now let's, let's get back to what, why we're talking about the baptismal Holy Spirit today. 
is that how many of you have never have, have not shared the word of God with somebody that of your friends because you're afraid of saying the wrong thing? You're afraid of the word. Well, what 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 happens if they ask me a question and I don't know the answer? What happens if I get going on something and then I realize, oops, I don't. <laughs> I, I should have gone there because I don't know anything about that. <clears throat> um, it says here that Jesus knew what to speak because the Holy Spirit was upon him without measure. So my point is, is that if you're going in to share God with some, share Christ with someone, maybe while they're talking or whatever, you just somebody. Build yourself up on your most holy faith, speaking in the Holy Spirit. Build it up, build it up. Prepare yourself before you ever enter into the schoolhouse, the, the workshop, the, uh, the, the grocery store. Prepare yourself on the way. Begin speaking in your heavenly language and allow the Holy Spirit to have that access to your lips. And all of a sudden, you'll, you'll, you'll realize words that you didn't realize you had in you are coming out your mouth. I've had people say things like this. Is that, is that I'm sitting there thinking, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. And all of a sudden, something whether it be the voice of Pastor Thad or something Pastor Thad said from the pulpit, I'll go, oh, I've got the answer. I'll just say what Pastor Thad said. That goes back to the 18 years. Previously, we've been sitting and listening and feeding. But see, when your heart and your mind, your mouth and your and your soul are be, are being consumed by the Holy Spirit, that's when the Spirit can give you the directions. Jesus did what he did. So we got the mouth. Jesus did what he did. Uh, he was anointed with the Holy Ghost, therefore with power. And he went around doing good and healing most. All because God was with him without measure. He did what he did. He said what he said because the Holy Spirit that was encompassed him without measure. Beloved, if you want to do the works that he did, say what he did, say, say the things that he said and operate the way he operated. Beloved, we, cannot, we can no longer shortchange the essentialness of the baptism of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It is the key. It is the key that opens those doors. Go over to Acts chapter 1. Hallelujah. I will never badmouth word of faith ever in my life because, again, I believe that's what 18 years of Jesus' life, that's what, I mean, having answers is, is great. But the one thing that a lot of word of faith, I don't hear a lot of them preach on the power of the Holy Spirit. And again, I'm not badmouthing any of them, not bound, but a lot of times we get really caught up in working the word. Is working the word important? You know it is. And again, I'm not bad-mouthing anybody. But beloved, if we don't let the importance of that heavenly language shine through on us, if we don't allow that to, to operate in us, we are limiting what God wants to do in our lives. We're trying to do things through, through programs and through uh, resources because we can't do it. we can't do it any other way. How do we build a church? Well, let's build a church through programs. I have no problem having programs. I have no problem doing things with our kids. I don't, I, that, that doesn't bother me. But beloved, programs aren't changing lives. The Holy Spirit will. Acts 1.8. Jesus said, now remember this. This is, this is so awesome. Because Jesus understood. I couldn't do anything until the Holy Spirit came on me. And I know that fries people's brain. Even saying it is weird. I think he could have, Pastor Thad. No, Jesus understood. Jesus understood. It was when the Holy Spirit came on me that I stepped into doing what I, what I was called to do. So he said, um, 
he said, I, here, here's what I need you to do. Acts 1, early. He said, I want you to go into Jerusalem. And I want you to tarry there. Hang out there. I don't want you doing anything. You know, they had a couple business meetings. But they didn't do a whole lot. They didn't go out and witness. They didn't go out and lay hands on the sick. There's no record of any of that. They went there and waited for 40 days. Did they go up in the upper room probably more than that one time? I'm sure they did. They went up there several times and prayed and worshiped and ate and, and, and had a great time together. They did a lot of that kind of stuff. But Jesus said, go to Jerusalem and wait for me. Terry, don't do anything until the gift comes. And I'm sure they're probably going, well, what's going to look like? What's it going to look like? Is it going to have, a, you know, is it going to be under the Christmas tree? What's it going to look like, Jesus? I, I don't understand what you're saying. And he said, go. You'll know when it comes, but don't do anything until that day comes. And then he, and then he says here in, in, in verse 8, he says, but when this gift comes, you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost or that gift has come upon you. And here's what you're going to do because of that power. You'll be witnesses unto me in both Jerusalem where you are, in Judea, the surrounding areas, in Samaria, uh, uh, a little further, and to every uttermost parts of the world. That means Ephesus. That means Corinth. That means Macedonia. That means Rome. It means Moorhead, Kentucky. But he said, you'll receive power to do it when the Holy Ghost comes on you. So chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in, the whole, in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. Whew, let the fire fall, let the wind blow. <laughs> uh, we actually had that song on our, on our, I don't like calling it a set list, on our list, worship list, a couple weeks ago. And I got done. And I was like, Lauren, can we do one more, please? Because I love that song. I love, it's just, it, gets, it gets me going. And he's like, nope. But Lord, I told Steve that we might play it. Can we please do it? So when I put it on this week, I was like, we're going. I, I didn't. So you're like, you disobeyed God? No, no, he wanted me to. He wanted me to, right? Oh, I got I to go back to reading. I'm, I'm just floating around in the pool, folks. I, I don't know about you. I'm just floating around in the pool. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound of a rushing mighty wind. Uh, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Listen, the sound filled the house. There was no physical wind. It was the sound of wind. It was the wind of heaven. God was blowing and it hit the place. Uh, everybody that would have been outside would have looked in and gone, oh, they're praying. But the, where there's a sound of wind, there's wind. Just point of information. And there appeared unto them Cloven tongues, let the fire, let <laughs> the wind blow. Cloven tongues of fire, and it sat upon each and every one of them, just like it sat on Jesus. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They had been sitting around for 40 days. They had business meetings. They ran the business. They ran through all that kind of stuff. They they operated as a small, not a small church. I want to be 120 before, you know, soon. Uh, they, they they operated as this as this church that is small compared to what they were getting ready to go into. What what was the difference that took them from the 120 to the 5,000 in one day? Holy Spirit, thou art welcome in. This place, Holy Spirit, thou art welcome in this place, omnipotent pa Father of mercy and grace, thou art welcome in 
this place. When the Holy Spirit fell, it was like fire that was shut up in their bones and they could not stay silent. That group that was in the upper room waiting for that moment knew the moment when it arrived and overflowed into the streets and began speaking in new tongues. And what specifically tongues did did they have? They didn't know the words they were speaking, but all these foreigners that came uh, from other lands were saying, hold it, he's speaking my language. It doesn't mean that the language that you're speaking in your heavenly language, it could be tongues of angels that that nobody on earth knows. Uh, but, But it does mean that for their sake, God said, guess what the purpose I'm giving you of tongues? You're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem today, in Jerusalem today, and to the uttermost parts of this earth, because my goodness, there's people from all over this place, and they're listening to the word of God being preached because, because the spirit of God is working through you, and I've got control of your mouth. Often our problem with complaining comes is because we've got more control of our mouth than the Holy Spirit does. And we need to spend more time speaking in the Holy Spirit so He has control of our mouth instead of us. Go to 1 Corinthians 12. We'll, we'll, We'll wrap it up with this here. See, there's one more aspect about being baptized in the Holy Spirit that I believe God wants us to have access of. And that's here in 1 Corinthians 12. And I I guess I didn't need you to turn there, but but it begins talking to us about the uh, gifts of the Spirit. It talks to us about the word of wisdom and word of knowledge. A word of wisdom is what to do. It It gives you direction. Uh, The word of knowledge is what has happened. Uh, In other words, that's what we can kind of refer to lovingly as reading one another's mail. Um, I always envied my dad because of his gift in that, um, that that he would, he would see things. And, and, and the Lord, Lord's allowed me to operate in that area a lot. Um, But I, I should say the way my dad operates, he's allowed me to, operate in that area a little, but my goodness, I didn't realize how much I operate in that area. And, um, I was accused when I was down in Texas, a lady quit coming to our church and I could, I I didn't know why she wouldn't talk to me. She wouldn't answer my phone calls. She wouldn't answer anything about me. And she quit coming to our church. And I, and, and I just, it was a mystery. I mean, this was a lady who went to Rama Bible college she attended there. She graduated from Rama. So I mean, it, it was she wasn't some country bumpkin. She was, uh, she was a very uh, strong Christian, and she quit coming to our church. And for months, I had no idea. And finally, uh, one of these little girls, she she kind of been in it, one of those girls that was in and out, um, very dear to us. But she um, she came and she said we took her out to dinner a little bit just to minister to her. And she goes. She goes, she started talking about Martha. And we were like, we, we don't know why Martha. She goes, I do. I said, you do? She said, yes, I was talking to her about church. And she said she had quit coming. And, and I said, why did you quit coming? Because she spoke, she, she was Spanish. So that's my Spanish accent. Why did you stop coming? And she said, because pastor's cheating. So what are you talking about? She said, there's no way that one man can know that much about me. She said, every time he preaches, he said he can be preaching on one thing and he'll shift and he gets right in my business. And she said, the only way, I, the only thing I can think of is that he goes through my garbage at night to get information, which makes me wonder what's in her garbage. What's in her garbage? I don't know what was in her garbage. But she said, it's the only thing I can think of. And I looked at her, I said, what? (laughs) That's insane. That's crazy. So I I began realizing the Holy Spirit moves me in that area more than I think he does. But, you know, Jesus, when he was with the woman at the well, what changed her life? The gift of the Spirit that was working through him. 
He said, yeah, you're right. You don't have, you don't have one. You don't have a husband. You've had five husbands. The one you're living with now is not your own. And what was her, what was her testimony when she left that place? The man at the well, you got to come listen to him because he told me my whole life and he didn't know me at all. So what, what a tool of that. What, what, what a tool of, of, of the Holy Spirit coming upon you and giving you wisdom uh, for someone. Um, faith, that's extraordinary faith. That's faith to do something in a situation that's beyond you. Gifts of healings. Again, that's, that's just the, the laying on hands, the healings happening uh, right there. Workings of miracle, working of miracles, discerning of spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues, prophecy. These are all gifts. But see, these gifts don't happen in churches that don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You're not getting the prophetic. You're not getting what we got today is not going to be happening in a, in a church that doesn't, it doesn't have, let the Holy Spirit work. And so what about you coming up to someone and saying, I don't know the words that are going to come out of my mouth, but you come up to them and the Holy Spirit starts letting you see their mail. And you're going, well, you know, is what are you talking about that? It's, uh, how did you know that? But these are available to us when we have that Holy Spirit upon us. Uh, go to Matthew 16. We'll wrap up this. I, I just, I, again, I, I know I went through that. I could go through that a lot slower. I've done it in the past. Um, but I, I'm, A, I'm out of time. B, I'm out of time. C, I'm out of time. D, I, I just, we, we got to close this thing up. But he said, man, I've given you all these gifts. And they're laying dormant because you're not using your heavenly language. He said, I've given you a command. I've given each and every one of you, children of God, a purpose. And every one of our general purposes, specific, I should say specific purposes, they shift. Some of y'all have worked with the park system or the, the, the forest system. Some of y'all have just been housewives. Some of y'all have been teachers or lunch ladies or carpenters or bankers or what that you it feels it was, we have so many different uh pictures here of what our uh, the purpose uh the specific purpose but every one of us has been given an overall purpose and jesus it was one of the last things recorded by uh both matthew and mark and in mark did i say matthew 16 mark 16 verse 15 it says and he said go into all the world Preach the gospel to every creature. Now, first of all, I want you to understand that this was not just the fivefold ministry offices. This is talking about every one of us. We all have, well, Pastor Thad, you're the pastor, so you need to preach. You're the believer, so you need to preach. Your pulpit looks different than mine. Here's mine. Had the good foundation, Mr. Bailey. Gave me bigger, which I'm forever grateful for. So is Pastor Elisa when she has to spread out all her stuff all over. That's my pulpit. Yours may be a desk that you sit in, a lunch table you share. It may be behind, instead of holding a microphone, maybe you're holding a hammer holding a piece of chalk, probably not a marker. Or a... Your pulpit looks different than mine. But if you're a believer, you're called to preach. I know you don't have to answer this. This is kind of what's the most important thing about preaching? Opening your mouth. Past, I think there's other important things. You can have all the wisdom in the world inside of you, and most of you do. But if you don't open your mouth. 
He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not will be damned. And these signs may follow them. Do you guys believe everything in the Bible? Thank you, Mike. Pastor Mike. That word shall, and I know we say it all the time, but I think it's good to remember that that is the most absolute word in Scripture. When it is used, it is not, it, it is not, there's not a question mark. There's not, it means God's, God is writing this as a contractual agreement between us. And he says, if you believe these signs will guaranteed 100% overwhelmingly follow you. That it's literally impossible if you believe for them to not come. You'll cast out demons. You'll speak in other tongues. Take up serpents. You drink any deadly thing. That means divine protection. It doesn't mean we're going to have serpents. Let me explain this to everybody who's who's ever questioned me on this. And I want to make this very clear to you. If there were ever any boxes of snakes in this church, I would be the last one to show up. (laughs) Y'all would be invited to my house. (laughs) Y'all would be on my house because I was like, hey, dudes, there's snakes in our church. Yeah, but they're in boxes. I don't care. They're ugly. I remember Steve Irwin going, look at the beautiful. I'm like, beauty? I guess it's in the eye of the beholder, but my Lord. All right. Take up serpents. If you drink any deadly thing, it's not going to harm you. That's just divine protection. It comes with when we just believe. We go, we're going to speak in tongues. We're going to see the, the, and lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. When he had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven, sat on the right hand of God. And we know that then between verse 19 and verse 20, there was a 40-day difference. But when that Holy Spirit came upon them, they preached everywhere. The Lord working with them with signs and wonders. Signs following them. He's just looking for someone who will recognize the, the Holy Ghost that's on you and consume you and quit trying to limit what God uh, uh, has for you and just step in. Amen? Let's stand together. I believe... That by far, a majority of us in this room are baptized with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Sometimes when a pastor knows that, it's kind of like not preaching on marriage or the family because there's only maybe one or two people that are married or have a family. They still need to hear it. So a lot of times pastors won't teach on it because... Well, why teach on it unless you want to get back people back? Well, if you're one, you need, if you're one that needs it, you're one that needs it. I believe today one of the main things that we need. Listen, if you want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, it's not it's not an exercise in. Uh, Determination. I'm going to stick with it. I'm going to keep on it. He said, ask. It's a gift. This is not hard. When, 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 I, when I lead people, I don't sweat and I don't spit and I don't take a, t- a long time. Um, I've, I've known people who've done that. I've sat there and, and, and I've prayed people through for hours. And I'm like, this, guy, this is not that hard. All I'll sit there and tell you is that he'll put the words in the mouth. You've got to open your mouth. And, and normally all I'll do is say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for the gift. Fill the mouth. 
And then I'll say, when I say amen, I'll say nobody in the room is allowed to speak English. <laughs> and all of a sudden people will open their mouth and the Holy Spirit will come through. I did that to a group of teenagers. We had, we had 10 ki kids in there. We had five of them that weren't baptized in the Holy Spirit. I explained, we were, we were praying, I th we were praying for our youth group or something like that. And, and there were five of them. I said, you guys want to get baptized? Yep. Yeah. So they got there. I signed one person that spoke, Holy Spirit, spoke in the Holy Spirit on each of them. I said, here's what we're going to do. I told them that. I said, I'm going to pray. Prayer. I'm going to thank God for the gift. And when I say amen, I said, at that time, I want you to lay your hands on them. And I want you to speak in English. I want you to speak in your heavenly language. And I said, all you guys that are wanting it, open your mouth. And I don't want you to speak in English. I want you to speak. And, and, and we did. I said, amen. Yes, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. They're, they're, they're going at it. And, and, I, I let, and then I said, don't, don't go over it in English. Just keep going. And, and about five minutes after we, we I, I, hands, I said, all right, how many received it? And they were all, all five of them. I was like, yeah, now let's, now, now let's go back to prayer. And it was it changed. So what I'm saying, I said all that to say this, is that I, 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 we could open up the altars, but this morning as, as we pray, just open your mouth. It's the Holy Spirit that gives it to me. It's not us. Just open your mouth. But the second part, and I believe that this is what the Holy Spirit is really wanting us to get on, is is for us to utilize our heavenly language, not weekly, not every other week, not when it feels convenient, but on a daily basis. Because there is power that is being left untapped into in our lives. There are things that we're not tapping into simply because we're not utilizing that gift that's been given to us. We are going through our days not, not aware that we've got this Holy Spirit upon us that gives us power. What if they laugh at us? Then strike them dead. No, no, no. Then, then you've got the power. You've got the power. Quit, quit giving them the power. If they don't have the Holy Spirit, they don't have power. Heavenly Father, I love you. And I'm grateful, Father, for... Listen, Lord, I'm thankful from everything that you've done this morning. It's nothing I could have orchestrated. I couldn't have planned it. I, you know, if I would have planned it, it would have, I would have fallen so short. But when you plan it, and when, when, when we just yield to you, it is unlimited what can happen. And so, Father, I'm so grateful. I'm so thankful, Father, for what you've done in this place. I'm thankful for your presence, and I'm thankful for your Holy Spirit. I'm thankful, Father, that you said that we don't have to do this on our own. We don't have to speak on our own. We don't have to live on our own. But we have been given the power of the Holy Spirit to carry out everything that we've been given to carry out. And so, Father, this morning, for those of us who have that heavenly gift, and maybe we just haven't been using it the way we need to use it. Maybe we've been allowing it to, uh, we've been allowing it to just kind of lay dormant. Because we've allowed it to lay dormant, there's a lot of other things that we've allowed to lay dormant. And Father, it's time that we pick it up. It's time that we put it to work. And it's time that we see that Spirit of God move like we've never seen it move before. So, Father, let us pick up those things that we've allowed to be, to be unused and allow them to be used like never before. Let us wake every morning with a new fresh burden, Father, for the lost. And let us use that heavenly language to give us the wisdom. And in Jesus' name right now, I speak to anybody in this room who's hungry for that baptism of the Holy Spirit and have decided... That they, that's what they want. That's what they desired. In Jesus' name right now, Father, I speak, I, I speak, Father, for that fire to touch their lips. I speak for that language to come in. And, Father, to take them over, Father, right now.
That as we, in the next few moments, I'm going to ask everybody in this room in a moment, when I say amen, just to use their heavenly language and speak in that heavenly language. And as we all speak in that heavenly language, Father, I pray, Father, right now, Lord, that you allow the fire of God to drop and to touch the tongues of those that are hungry for it and that they will just join right in. And that Holy Spirit will now be at access to what they can use on their own. Father, we love you. We love you. And we thank you for it in Jesus. Let's fill this place with our heavenly language one more time this morning. Yandana makonso landa.